and welcome back to our One Wild and Precious Lives and Our Dogs. Today I'm talking to Mark Bikoff, a professor emeritus at the University of Colorado Boulder. I know Mark because I've had the great pleasure to translate two of his books into German. His latest book, A Dog's World, was just released under the title Die Welt der Hunde, ein Gedankenexperiment in German. And especially during my first translation uh, for Mark, the translation of Canine Confidential, I've occasionally reached out just to make sure I was choosing the best possible wording or phrasing to accurately convey his ideas to a German speaking audience. And since we're, we're already talking dogs and we're both fascinated also by the free roaming dogs of the world, what better occasion than the release of the German book to invite Mark onto the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to talk about dogs and their future in a human-less world. <laughs> Please it's introduce yourself. Here. Thank yeah, you. your pronouns, yeah. the non-human animals in your life these days, if there are any, and anything else you'd like our listeners to know. I moved down from the mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado, after there was a big flood about nine years ago. So I, I don't live with any dogs, but I have plenty of dogs in my life. And it, it works well for me. Um, yeah. I was traveling a lot. And I was spoiled when I lived in the mountains. And part of living up there is what got me really interested in thinking about the behavior of homed dogs and more free ranging or feral dogs. I mean, my dogs had a home, but they really were free ranging with their buddies on the mountainside rarely had a collar, rarely were leashed. Mm -hmm. And was that the norm in that area? Oh, yeah. There were only five or six, I guess, six houses at the end. And mm. every house had a dog. And the dogs all came down to my house because I fed them. And <laughs> and if people left, I had a really secure outdoor run because there were black bears and cougars or mountain lions and red foxes and coyotes living right at my door. I remember you mentioning that in Canine Confidential, the first book of yours that I translated. This is something I wonder about. I have never lived in an area where there are these kinds of predators. Is this something you worried about by giving your dog free range? Like that they would get eaten by a cougar? Oh yeah, we worried about it a lot. But really in the decades I lived there with many, many dogs at my house and other houses, we literally never had one bad mm -hmm. encounter. I think part of it was because we taught the dogs not to go in certain areas and they did it. Mm -hmm. And the other is we really valued their freedom. And so I trained my dogs really. It's so easy to do that every time my hand went into my right pocket, they got a treat. Yeah. Because so I, I taught them they, they would run away. They'd run around. They'd look and if my hand went up and into my pocket, they came because I didn't want to have to yell, come on, Jethro or Moses or, yeah. you know, whoever it was, my neighbor's dogs as well. So it was a concern, but we never had we, literally not one single mm -hmm. incident in countless dog bear hours or dog cougar hours. I mean, there was an element of luck there for sure, but also part of it was simply because we really taught our dogs to look at us. And we kept them within range and we knew not to put them out early in the morning or through the night. And uh, yeah. we cleaned up around our home. I mean, it was all good husbandry, if you will. But, you know, that's what you do because we didn't want any incidents. Right. Yeah, no, um, because I've seen, sometimes <laughs> I see pictures on Facebook where someone is taking a picture out of their window and there's a bear in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Is that because they're leaving trash out or, and so that never happened to you because we were careful? Or will bears come so close? I had bears right at my door. Yeah. But I knew enough to know when they were coming or or not to put the dogs out when the bears or the cougars were most active. Oh, okay. Yeah. And cleaning up garbage. Yeah. Cleaning up garbage and dog food and other things really works because all those animals, the predators, are looking for a free meal. Right. And and dogs would be a free meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though I had really large dogs. So like I said, I think it was an element of luck. Mm -hmm. And and I think they were street smart. Yeah. They, I mean, they knew the bears and cougars were around before I did. 
I mean, because of their noses. And would they, did they recognize them as predators that they should be careful around? Or would they be interested in going after them? I never really had an encounter like that. But yeah, I think hardwired, they knew that these animals were dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Something instinctual in them. Yeah. It's really interesting to me because I have never lived in an area where there were these kinds of predators. This is just nothing I ever had to think about for my own dogs. Right. As someone who tries to maximize their freedom, but also balance that with, you know, keeping them safe, of course. So, yeah, I mean, that is a factor that I never had to, to factor in when making decisions for my own dogs. Yeah. But it's interesting to know yeah. that it can be done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that hard to do, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's take that as a jumping in point. I'd love to talk a little bit about a dog's world. So okay. um, for anyone who hasn't read this book and is listening, would you briefly summarize what inspired the book, what it is about, and why is it is relevant for today's dog owners? Oh, there's so many reasons, but the main reason would be that in the book, Jessica Pierce and I were really writing about the nature of dog-human relationships. I mean, there's sections on ethology and dog behavior, and there's sections on how dogs became dogs or how wolves became dogs. But really, part of the motivation was when we consider how dogs would do without us, it really raises questions about the nature of dog-human relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and our bottom line at the end was a lot of dogs would do very well without us. And it mm -hmm. wasn't meant in a negative way about dog human relationships. It just meant that all the all dogs emerge from a common wolf ancestor. They have wolf genes. They have wolf engrams in their brains running around, you know, their neural circuits. So in the right circumstances and with a little bit of luck, when dogs became wild members of wild communities, which is exactly what, who they would be, mm -hmm. they'd be able to compete, cooperate, and coexist with these animals. Deep in their genes, a lot of them would be able to hunt very well, get food. They wouldn't get veterinary care. They wouldn't get a nice pillow to sleep on. <laughs> they, you know, they would not get regular meals of often genuinely crappy food. Yeah. I mean, True. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So after you get through the joke of it all, it's a serious book. Yeah. But many dogs would do okay. You know, people would talk about whether large dogs would do better than small dogs. And no, not at all. Small dogs could get away from, you know, competitors or predators. They wouldn't yeah. need as many calories in a day. They could hide. They would be faster. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily the case. They would do better than large dogs. Large dogs would be yeah. better competitors. They would need more calories and more food. But, you know, once again, the, all the generalizations that we thought about and others thought about didn't hold. The bottom line being that an individual dog would do well in certain yeah. situations and not others. And you'd have to take into account the individual personality mm -hmm. and, if you will, motor skills and strength of a dog to make any realistic predictions. Yeah. Yeah, so one thing I'm interested here, so you mentioned the engrams in the dog's brains. Right. So that because their ancestors were able to hunt cooperatively, obviously. But um, many dogs I see around myself, even the free roaming dogs, there's lots of free roaming dogs where I am now, they don't hunt cooperatively. They just eat human waste or they get handouts by humans. Mm -hmm. Do you think do you think this engram can just be activated? Is that like a switch that can flip when necessary? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, you could look at it metaphorically that way. Yeah, I mean, there's certain things in our brains that are Paleolithic or Neand you know, Neanderthal or whoever our ancestors are. So the situation might, ar might not arise that would flip that switch. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jessica and I talked about it and similarly, that like with the killing bite, domestication has, you know, basically weeded out the killing bite for good reasons. We don't want dogs killing one another when they play mm -hmm. or if they have a fight and we don't want them biting us. I mean, some dogs have stronger bites than others for sure. So yeah, it's just there. And from an ethological point of view, 
it's some kind of sign, we call it a sign stimulus or a critical stimulus mm -hmm. that will release a certain behavior. So is it like, um, like a modal action pattern? Like for example, the hunting sequence is being released by a certain stimulus and it's there in certain dogs, certain breeds of dogs, certain individuals, not in all of them. Do you think that engram would be similarly? Like the engram of knowing how to hunt cooperatively I'm not sure I'm using the word engram correctly. Correct me, please. No, you're right on all accounts. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in there, you know, in a, from classical ethology, if you have a sign stimulus that releases a certain behavior, the behavior follows a certain pattern. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's not like there's a set pattern in the brain of the dog that will then go off that activates muscles and, you know, their sense mm -hmm. organs, but it will activate you know, behavior patterns that can be used to get food. We call yeah. them predation. No, absolutely. And, and I mean, I've seen it in free ranging dogs. I mean, sometimes people will argue and, and they may be right that even in a home dog who all of a sudden stands up and sees a stuffed animal or, or even a mouse, but a sock, mm -hmm. and something snaps and they go through a very predictable sequence. It's not one-to-one -one predictable, but they'll go through a predictable sequence ending in catching, biting, head shaking, and if you will, yeah. in the wild, it would be killing and consuming the prey. So you see those when dogs play with socks. No, I mean, I have a dog like this. I have a dog who has right. chickens and ducks. And she would, if I left her out there alone in this small village where every second house has either chickens or sheep or both, she would of course she would go because it's fun for her, right? She, yeah. she would go around and kill like half the animals of the village. And then someone would shoot her because they would be like, come on, you can't just go around killing my animals. But so what I struggle with as I'm following, like, I like your arguments, but there's something that, so my dog, I know she knows she has the connection between an animal and food. Like she knows that this is something she can eat. For example, when she killed that duck, I didn't expect her to kill the duck because I expected the duck to fly away. Right. <laughs> and it just yeah, didn't. Exactly. Yeah. It was a wild duck. So then I'm like, I don't want that duck to have died a pointless death. So I took the duck home and I fed it to my dog over the next couple of days. So, and I mean, I tried plucking it, but I had never plucked an animal before. So there was lots of feathers still on it and she ate it so she can make that connection. But I don't think that's true for all dogs. I think some dogs would enjoy the hunting and the killing, but then not recognize the dead animal as something they could actually eat, right? Absolutely. Because one of the arguments in the book, and I mentioned it before, you would be taking into account individual personalities, mm -hmm. you'd be taking into account the experience a dog might have had you know, prior to being on, on its own. So we talked about first generation dogs who would be dogs yeah. like your dog who would have had human contact. But subsequent to that, if yeah. we all disappear, there won't be any human contact. So that's really the true test. So you're absolutely right. There will be individual differences, even among litter mates, yeah. you know, when they're born either to a mom when there's humans around or in the post-human situation where there are no humans around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I explain to people, it's like going to a dog park, even with siblings, even with litter mates, they will respond differently to being exposed to other dogs and humans at a dog park. That's true. Yeah. And, and it'll be the same in the wild. And, you know, will the offspring of homed dog, previously homed dogs um, in the first generation be not as well off as, say, free ranging or feral dogs? That's a reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, we have no way of testing it. Yeah. I'm curious. You mentioned you've seen dogs hunt cooperatively. I've never seen that. Well, I mean, it's just random observations of dogs uh -huh. in the mountains. Um, some work my a graduate student of mine did many decades ago on, on feral yeah. dogs. They'll form groups that look like packs. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of work being done on packs of dogs outside of the Rome airport for example. Oh, yeah. By Roberto Bonani and his crew, they form packs. They have dominance hierarchies. They have very distinct social relationships among, you know, group or pack members yeah. just like wolves and coyotes might have. That uh, that's for sure. Like I do see that also among the free roamers here. 
-hmm. but the free roamers here that I've seen, like I've seen free roaming dogs in, in Thailand, in Guatemala and Mexico, mm -hmm. and they were all dependent on anthropogenic food resources. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious is about is my theory would be at first they would eat all the trash, then they would kill all the livestock and then they would die because they don't know how to hunt cooperatively. And once you've eaten all the livestock, which is easy to kill by yourself, for example, my dog, but my dog doesn't know how to hunt cooperatively. She knows how to hunt and kill and eat that prey animal, but it's going to be a sheep. It's going to be a chicken, right? But once all of those are gone, because I think they will also die, she'll mm -hmm. have to hunt deer. And in order mm -hmm. to hunt deer, she will have to hunt cooperatively. She will be part of a social group of dogs because I see the dogs around me forming social groups mostly to use your term, loose social groups. But so how does it happen? How do they go or how can they make that jump oh. from just being a loose social group who relies on anthropogenic food resources to being a pack that actually hunts cooperatively and is independent of humans? Yeah. I'm so curious I about this. How would that happen? How does that happen in the feral dogs? Do you know that you've seen well in the mountains around Boulder? It, it happens around, you know, wild animals. A wolf leaves their pack and they join up with other wolves if, you know, if they can, or a coyote yeah. or even families of red foxes. But the scenario is very simple. I mean, you know, one thing about dogs is somewhere deep in their gene pool, they, there's a, you know, I would call it some kind of social instinct, if you will. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. they're social animals. They're very diverse. Yeah. So they may not form, you know, if such a high ranking alpha male, testosterone loaded males got together, they may have trouble forming a coherent pack. But, you know, the different personalities and different uh, temperaments mm -hmm. uh, would would mesh and just, which is exactly what you see in wild packs of wolves and coyotes. I mean, yeah, you just yeah. have six alpha animals, male or female, or may, yeah. may, you know, form a coherent pack. Some will be more social than others. But I think what will happen with feral dogs, I mean, then these will be feral dogs when they're on their own yeah. after we're gone, would be that they will work it out to form packs in which there will be divisions of labor. There will be hunters. If there's females, there'll be moms, there'll be helpers. Yeah. Um, after a while, there'll be young of, you know, their children of different ages. I can imagine all of these things perfectly. And I totally think that we'll be able to form packs. But the one puzzle piece that to me is hard to imagine is the cooperative hunting. So if you're a certain size, I loved how you explained that in the book. If you're a chihuahua sized dog, you may be able to sustain yourself on mice and insects and fruit, right? But if you're the size of my dog, she's a Malinois, you need larger prey. And let's say she needs to hunt deer in order to do so, she will have to hunt cooperatively because otherwise the deer will get away. So that, that skill, I, I just can't imagine if a dog doesn't learn that if my dog had puppies and I gave those puppies to a, I don't know, to a wolf to foster, then maybe they would learn. like, I'm assuming there's some sort of social learning involved there too. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah. It is hard to imagine, but I've seen coyotes yeah. on their own who go off on their own form packs and lone wolves will meet up with other lone wolves and form groups. And then they will develop social relationships, the results of which might be you hunt, I stay home, yeah. or we both hunt together. Fascinating. But, you know, they're communicating with one another all the time. And it could be just trial and error learning. I mean, it could be as simple as that. Social learning. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And they run after a deer and one is faster than the other and the other is slow. The one fast one gets tired, veers off, the slower one takes over. Yeah. So it would be analogous to putting together like a basketball team or a soccer football team. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's different because I can say you do this, you play this position and all that. But there's no reason to think that when garbage is gone, there's foraging wolves, there's bears, you know, and other animals. Yeah. So there's no reason to think that they all might not be challenged to some bit. Yeah. Yes, you won't have human hunters, you know, killing the deer or the moose or, you know, whatever ungulate or other animal becomes prey. Yeah. So there may be more of them. 
but it's the plasticity among dogs that is really going to work to their benefit. Yeah. They're flexible. They're not, you know, they may be hardwired to do certain things, but in the end, the social relationships they form and the need for food or safety or cooperative breeding will take over their behavior and they'll be able to form either packs among other free ranging dogs, feral and feral in this case, you know, they're very social. And we already know right now that dogs and wolves and coyotes can get along. Yeah. No, right. Yeah. And especially when they're young. Yeah. So the feral dogs you see in the mountains or you've seen in the mountains around you, do they, are they a mixed group or pack of coyotes and dogs or are they only dogs? No, no just dogs. Yeah. I mean, just domestic dogs. And they don't get fed by humans at all. And they don't scavenge. They, or they don't scavenge on human created resources. They hunt. Oh, well, most of them get, you know, a lot of the free ranging dogs get human handouts. So there are mm -hmm. anthropogenic sources, but there are feral packs of dogs. One of which um, my, my students studied who were pretty much on their own. Yeah. They might make an occasional trip to a dump. Yeah. But predominantly, you know, on their own. And they hunted cooperative, like they did hunt. Yeah, they did. And and, wow. and there's a whole there's a whole literature there. We mention it in the book just a bit because number one, we it, it would be another book which other people have. No, written. I want to read that book. You should write that book or <laughs> but, <laughs> well there is that book. And if you remember we talked about the behavior of Free ranging dogs, and the name the guy's name will come to me. Yes, okay, I, I remember because you Matt. mentioned that book several times. Yes, yeah, it's on my Amazon wish list already. Okay, <laughs> well, yeah. he and the co, you know, the people who contributed chapters mm -hmm. to that book, dogs are a problem in different areas of the world. Free ranging and feral dogs. Mm -hmm. they, there was an article in bioscience that we measured that that really estimated that dogs were responsible for 85 percent of losses of some wildlife pop wild population oh, yeah. that's that's 85 85 percent yeah yeah that is a lot yeah it's not matt gomper is the name he, he edited mm -hmm. this book on the behavior and ecology of free-ranging dogs so there's lots of examples out there of dogs forming groups and hunting together yeah but it, but once again, it's not surprising if, you know, you you know that they're inherently social creatures. I mean, there's lone dogs and just just like wolves are inherently social creatures, but they're alone wolves. They yeah. may be lone, or coyotes. They may be alone, not of their own choosing. Yeah. But they, they can survive. So there's a lot of examples now where dogs will hunt together. There's no really good examples that I know of, of, say, dogs and wolves or dogs and coyotes, for example, mm -hmm. or jackals in Africa forming these partnerships. But there's no reason to think they couldn't. Right. Yeah. Because they can breed. So why wouldn't they be able to become and, members of, a, of the same group? Yeah. In theory. And, and, their, and their ethogram, their behavioral repertoire is extremely similar. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... If I showed you like, an, you know, if I showed you some social interaction patterns for play or dominance or fighting or even predation among, say, wolves, coyotes, jackals and dogs, yeah. you would not be able, you really wouldn't be able to differentiate them because really? their yeah. behavioral repertoire is so similar. Yeah. Yeah. You've got me almost convinced that <laughs> maybe the fate of the post-human dog is not as dire as I as I kind of felt it would be. Do you, for, by any chance, has your student who is studying the pack of feral dogs outside of Boulder, is that already published? I would be so curious no. to read that study. No, that some of those data were incorporated in different papers I wrote. It, okay. was, a, it was predominantly an undergraduate project. And it wasn't because the data weren't good, but, you know, they move on. Yeah. And, yeah. and it takes a long, you know, one of the criticisms we make in, a dog's world, or you know, whatever it's called, auf Deutsch, mm -hmm. um, is that, and it's not because the science isn't good. In fact, I just published something on this. It's people are studying a dozen or two dozen dogs, different dogs in different labs, 
different methodologies, although they may be homing in on the same sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they could do these studies really rapidly. Yeah. Studies of free ranging dogs that I in India, Bali, Italy, and other places now, they take a long time. I mean, after eight and a half years of studying wild coyotes in Wyoming, yeah, we're still learning things. Yeah, and you know, the ongoing wolf studies in Yellowstone that have been going on for you know almost well, I guess what would it be? Um, 28 years, give or take. I mean, they're still learning things. Wow. Yeah, that just goes to show how complex these species are. It's incredibly complex. And when you remove humans from the scene, I mean, in my humble opinion, there's no reason why a lot of dogs won't do very well and they'll, they'll form groups that resemble wolf packs mm -hmm. or coyote packs. They're very similar. Yeah. But they will form social relationships that allow them to work together and coordinate their behavior. Yeah. And co and cooperate. They'll have scuffles, just like there are scuffles in wolf packs. Right. There will be dogs who either are forced out or just decide to leave because they can't bond with other animals. So they, they leave of their own accord. So I think down the road, if I could be the ethologist on the wall in a couple of hundred years after <laughs> we disappear. Yeah. I think you'll see a lot of very similar things. Yeah. It won't be easy. But maybe for some animals, it will be. It's almost like a form of speciation. I mean, dogs will be dogs. You know, if they breed among themselves, you know, they're still going to be Canis lupus familiaris. Maybe down the pike, if they're breeding, which they can with jackals, wolves, and coyotes, new subspecies or species will emerge. But there's no reason to think that there would be selection against high levels of sociality. Yeah. When females have their children or a pack has children, maybe dad will be around to help raise the children. There'll be aunts and uncles and other adults. Yeah. I think down the line, we'll see pretty much what we're seeing now among the wild social carnivores such as wolves. Yeah, that is so fascinating. Well, we're almost running out of time. And I one very important question I would love to hear your input in. I mean, I've read it in the book, but better coming from you. The book you wrote is very relevant to mm -hmm. dog owners today, even though we live in a world with humans. What makes it so relevant or what's the bottom line of the book? Right. There's a number of bottom lines, but the, one of the bottom lines is for people to realize that homed dogs live very curtailed lives with not many freedoms. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to ponder what a dog say just an individual dog or a group of dogs or, or dogs in general would be like on their own they'll be able to choose who to mate with when to have babies if to have babies they'll be able to eat when they want you know in the best of all possible worlds it'll be constrained if they're wild and they'll choose the foods that they can get easily for mm -hmm. example in the book you remember we have these huge tables of gains and losses yeah they'll lose the safety of a home so what? They'll find safety out in the, in the wild in holes in the ground or in dens. They'll be able to, you know, take exercise when they want. It'll be constrained by the presence of other animals. Mm -hmm. So it's just asking people. It's not a criticism. It's asking people to realize what a home dog's life is like. Mm -hmm. We decide when, where and when and how they can play with friends or eat or pee and poop. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people... I'm not part of the high stress group, but there's a lot of people who think that most home dogs are just inevitably and perennially stressed by living with their humans. Mm -hmm. I think there are some and many who are, but some don't. Mm -hmm. I think it's very possible. It's extremely possible to have a good life as a home dog, as long as your human is fluent in dog. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. They understand. And as long as they have their best your best interests in mind. Yeah. But the other thing is it calls attention to the fact that dogs aren't, I mean, two big myths out there. Dogs are unconditional lovers and dogs are our best friends. They're not our best friends. Dog abuse is rampant around the world. It sells books, but it isn't. Mm. People go, oh, dogs will love me no matter what I do to them. No, they won't. And they don't love other dogs no matter what they do to them. Or, or, or in the case of becoming members of wild communities, 
They won't form bonds with just any wolf or bear. They may form with wild cats. Cats and dogs can form, you know, very tight mm -hmm. relationships. So it's really, in a sense, asking people to consider your life with your dog right now and what are the gains and what are the losses. Yeah. But not to be so human centered that, oh, no, my dog won't do well without me. And in fact, most of the people we asked said my dog would probably do OK without me. But there'll be all uh -huh. these caveats that you and I are discussing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hadn't really thought about that very much. But in the course of a number of interviews and then Jessica started thinking about it, that it wasn't the reason we wrote the book, but there's a real good reason why people should read the book in terms of assessing their yeah. relationship. And it really follows up on our book, Unleashing Your Dog, where we really dress the captive nature of the lives of these dogs, yeah. many dogs. But once again, not saying it's it's brutally bad and we're bad humans. It's more get a hold of who these dogs are. Yeah. We are responsible for them, but we can make their lives a lot richer and better. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree with you. We can give them choices and more of a say in their yep. lives, even though, even if they are captive with us. Absolutely. And it's just about thinking about it and finding those possibilities to just give them a little more freedom, right? Like to give them more than one spot where they can sleep or are comfortable so they can choose between those spots, like simple things like this. Absolutely. And give them a choice of food. My dogs, I think I may have even mentioned it. They loved bean and rice burritos. They loved peanut <laughs> butter bagels and bagel, you know, and all that. Yeah. Enrich their lives. That That's yeah. the bottom line is know who a dog is, know about their wild ancestry, know that just like you and me, they don't want to be fully constrained all the time. And, you know, cashing it out is giving them as much control and giving them as much control and as many choices as you can and, you know, granting them agency. That's really yeah. the word that people use. We, I've actually had, and I'm sure Jessica has too, numerous emails thanking us for raising these points. Yeah. Because it's easy to get in the habit of just thinking, my dog's happy, they wag the tail, we take them to the dog park, they get vet care, we give them food, they get a soft bed and they're happy. They're bored to hell most of the time. Well, I would be bored to hell, yeah. Yeah, work, work make, have them work for their food. I used to plant uh, food around my, the, my property and I'd watch all the dogs go out <laughs> and look for it. But I did want to make the case that there's a lot going on there and that really as a thought experiment, it had a lot of dimensions that that I hadn't thought about and Jessica hadn't thought about and or say neither of us had thought about. But really, it's asking people to appreciate dogs for who they are, what they need, what they want, that they, they're not going to unconditionally love us. They may act as if they do. But, you know, because some people give dogs tough love and the tough love means they'll do whatever you want, but they're scared out of their minds all the time. But it also asks us to assess our relationship with dogs in terms of what we can do to increase their freedoms. I use the, yeah. the, plural, the plural of freedoms. Yeah. Give them more choices, more control, more agency in what they eat, when they eat, how they eat when they play, where they play, how they play. Where they want to go on the walk. They want to go to the left or to the right or straight, right? Right. Yeah. Let yeah. them make that choice. When right. dogs are on their own, you know, they'll sniff give or take a third of the time. And I love meeting people in Boulder who have dogs on a leash. And there'll be people who are just standing there for five minutes while their dog sniff because the walk is for them. Yes. You know? I love when I see that too. It makes me so happy. Because yeah. you also see the other people who will drag their dog along on the leash. Um, <laughs> and it always stands out for yeah. me to me when someone stops and watches their dog and gives them the time to window shop and check their Facebook profile or the local blackboard or whatever they're doing, right? Yep. No, no. That's what they're doing. They're window shopping and they're trying to get the most they can out of an odor or a sound or a visual stimulus. I'll end off saying when people appreciate dogs for who they are, and the people have become dog literate or fluent in dog, 
they will have a much better take on what their dogs want and need. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I really believe that the more freedom you give a dog or the more freedoms you give a dog, the happier the dog will be and the easier they will be to live with. A, a lot of times it's like with people, yeah. oh, you can control people and they resent it and dogs might resent it in, in a canine way. But when they feel that you're honoring who they are and respecting them for who they are, there might be more degrees of freedom in terms of saying, okay, Mark has to go, Chrissy has to go, they're going to put me in, you know, they're going to put me in this outdoor run or whatever, wherever you put them, but they're going to come back and love yeah. me. And that I think is important because they'll anticipate differently a friendly or not so friendly human coming back to them. Yeah. Bueno. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again. And I will let you go. Great. Have a lovely afternoon. Not Don't work too much. <laughs> I won't. Danke schön. <laughs> Immer gern und bis zum nächsten Mal. Sehr gut. <laughs> I used to be, I was once fluent in German. I noticed because you, you sometimes use German words. Yeah. Um, um, so it's more like, than just hello and goodbye. No, I used to really be good in German. I had to read Conrad Lorenz and a whole uh, lot of other yeah, yeah. things. And I used to pick up Design and any, you know, any newspaper or yeah. magazine before I, tr I travel but it's gone so <laughs> anyway I'm gonna go thank you Chrissy I look forward to chatting with you again me too <laughs> take Great. care bye-bye okay bye-bye